1966, a report was compiled for NASA by four of the top scientists and astronomers of the time. The report became known as the Translunar Phenomena Report. It was a compilation of reports of odd and strange lights seen on the lunar surface by astronomers in the past. These events included the sightings of moving objects, flashes of light, and many other odd events on the lunar surface. The people reporting these events on the surface of the moon were famous astronomers. In this compilation, there are many reports of odd and strange activity around the crater called Aristarchus. In 1966, Barbara Middlehurst presented a remarkable paper on transient lunar phenomena to NASA. And this was an exhaustive compilation of research data indicating anomalous light phenomena that had been occurring on the moon ever since the dawn of the telescope. These transient lunar phenomena include lights of different colors, some of which are solid, some of which are flashing. They include phenomena that stay still. They include phenomena that are moving. And in some cases, you have multiple groups of phenomena moving in different directions all at the same time. What's particularly of interest in this case is that many of these phenomena, about 60%, were seen around the crater Aristarchus. And when the Clementine space probe actually flew over the Aristarchus crater, a very clearly obvious blue dome is visible. Taken together, this study of transient lunar phenomena strongly suggests that there have been ongoing observations of extraterrestrial pilot vehicles that have existed around our moon and its surface for all of recorded history. This is not something that is hard to understand. These sightings were done independently all throughout the world, in some cases professionally, in some cases with amateur telescope operators. And the point is that when you are faced with this weight of data, you are looking at something that is actually genuine. This is an ongoing phenomenon, well documented. But then once the Apollo missions start, the blanket of secrecy and silence comes down and you never hear about transient lunar phenomena again. I guess the question then would be then, well, okay, if there were these ancient astronauts, as they call them, uh, in our distant past, uh, did they all leave? Or are some of them still here? How do you answer that? Well, uh, it's real simple. You look at truthfully and clearly at human history. If, as we're taught in school, uh, we're the product of just a slow evolutionary climb from uh, cavemen to hunter-gatherers to city-states to nations to empires, you know, as, we, as we're taught, then that should be our history and there shouldn't be anything else there. But if you look carefully, you'll find that from the flying boats of the ancient uh, Egyptians to the dragons of the Chinese to the Dogon tribe in Africa that talks about the you know, people come from Sirius and you, you, you talk about the uh, Aboriginal Aborigines in Australia that talk about the gods, you talk about the uh, Aztecs and the Incas that talk about the gods from the sky, and then you bring it right on up to the UFO, to the cattle mutilations, to the crop circles, to the abductions. Somebody's still here. I believe that we have been observed and monitored for a long, long time. I think what we call the UFO phenomenon probably goes through our entire history. For me, when I look at ancient, advanced, like ridiculously, inexplicably advanced technology, the one thing I continue to go back to is the Great Pyramid at Giza. There is, in my view, not any conventional explanation for this at all. Uh, when you start getting into the mathematics, the engineering, the geographic location of it, among many, many other things, this indicates to me that whoever built that pyramid knew that the Earth was a sphere, they knew exactly where they were in relation to the entire world. Uh, they had engineering and transport capabilities that no one is able to explain. They completed a task that not a single human civilization could possibly have done until possibly the last hundred years. It's even a stretch to ask ourselves, could we have done, duplicated this today? Maybe we could, but could we have even done it as recently as 100 years ago? Could the United States of, say, Teddy Roosevelt have built the Great Pyramid? The answer is no. It's no, they couldn't have done it. They couldn't have done it with the precision and the exactitude. So I asked myself, if the ancient Egyptians were more advanced than America of the early 20th century, then there's something wrong here with this picture. So there's something in the mix of our civilization that we're not getting. There's a hole in our ancient history. And some of that includes very advanced knowledge. 
Based on my, uh, my research, I believe that the, the beings are advanced approximately close to a million years. And the reason why I say that is because if you study the ancient tablets, the, the Bhagavad Gita, the Mahabharata, the ancient Vedas, and also the Sumerian tablets, you find that the technology that they used was so far advanced. They had technology that can destroy an entire planet. They had vehicles that can travel intergalactically. Uh, and uh, you can even see some of the evolution of, in the Sumerian text, you can tell that they were a little bit less advanced than some of the older texts because you can see the evolution of their technology where when they first splashed down 450,000 years ago, they had a lot of rumblings and sounds and noises when they would take off and land. Then closer to around 2000 BC, you find that they're hovering silently, almost like anti-gravity, uh, whisper quiet, you know, so you can even see the advances in their technology as the, as the millennia went on. There are a number of very uh, compelling stories that I believe that have to do with NASA encounters with extraterrestrials in relation to the moon. I'm reminded of the story relating to Neil Armstrong, a woman at a function where Neil Armstrong was present, eavesdropped on a conversation that Neil Armstrong was having with another person, a doctor of some sort. And the impression I get is that she was standing maybe 10 feet away while this conversation took place. And the, and the doctor said to Neil Armstrong, the question probably everyone in the world would want to ask, what really happened on the moon? To which Neil Armstrong said, and this is quoted in books and it's on the web, uh, essentially that we were watched the whole time that we were on the moon. Uh, there were craft there, they were huge. These babies were huge, they were menacing. On September 12, 1991, NASA launched space shuttle mission number 48. Three days into the mission, as they were deploying the upper atmosphere research satellite, something odd was caught on the shuttle's camera. The footage that was seen from a portion of the space shuttle mission STS-48 is highly, highly interesting and clearly one of the best smoking guns that we have for proof of UFO activity taking place in low Earth orbit and of countermeasures against those UFOs from some alleged entity on Earth. While the space shuttle was gently drifting over Alice Springs, Australia, we see this very clear orb of light that is moving slowly through the atmosphere. And then the orb suddenly jumps to life and makes clearly what we would call non-Newtonian movement, meaning movement that would normally destroy anyone inside from the G-forces involved. And right after it makes that movement, some kind of particle beam shoots up from the Earth's surface and it actually illuminates the entire atmosphere in the process because there's so much energetic charge on it. On STS-48 was a space shuttle mission that took place in 1990 and what it shows is an object, probably a flying saucer technology, coming up over the horizon, traveling along the horizon, a bright flash goes off, the object is shot at, it actually comes to a complete stop, and then makes a 45 degree angle turn instantaneously, so fast that it basically would generate about 14,000 Gs, which is the equivalent of a 10 story building being dropped on top of you. And then there's a couple of streaks that go by. Clearly the thing is being shot at. And the interesting thing about this that actually kind of supports that is we have a very, very secret CIA base at Alice Springs in Australia, right above the area where this test took place. So what people think is that weapons were actually fired from the ground, probably some sort of railgun weapon, at the spacecraft just to test if we could create a sort of anti-aircraft defense based on these new technologies. This has every hallmark of being an effort to shoot down an extraterrestrial piloted vehicle in which case they would then send in someone like Sergeant Clifford Stone to go and retrieve the wreckage, the debris, and the dead or alive extraterrestrial occupants that were piloting that craft. But it was half out and half in, and I could tell that it was dead. The Brookings Institute is one of Washington, D.C.'s oldest think tanks. In the early 1960s, they were tasked by NASA to answer a single question. What would happen to humanity if we discovered evidence of alien activity in outer space? Their answer became known as the Brookings Report. 
In 1960, a think tank called Brookings Institution came out with a special report in which they had gone in and investigated the question of disclosure and the widespread revealing of the existence of intelligent extraterrestrial civilizations visiting the Earth. Based on certain classic memes, such as the infamous 1939 War of the Worlds radio broadcast hosted by Orson Welles, in which allegedly people thought they were being invaded by Martians, people started stuffing wet towels up their chimney, they started freaking out, believing the world was over. This and other events made the Brookings Institution conclude that they could not tell us the truth because it would be a fatal blow against the stability of civilization as we know it. Rumors that there was a close encounter with aliens at Holloman Air Force Base have been swirling since at least the 1970s. There is even a supposed film of the flying saucer landing. There was an alleged contact between extraterrestrials and the U.S. military industrial complex that took place at the Holloman Air Force Base. This appears to be one of several such contacts, but what is interesting about this one in particular is that these groups of extraterrestrials seem to have a very elaborate headdress that was on, as well as unusual faces that were kind of very small and tapered with a pronounced nasal feature. These extraterrestrials, like many of the others, did apparently want peace. They were trying to negotiate some sort of positive settlement for Earth's problems, but as is the case, they want disarmament of nuclear weapons, they want the truth to be told to the people, and the military industrial complex and the government officials just laughed in their faces. When we start getting into the upper highest level echelon of the cover-up of the UFO phenomenon, I still feel that I need to be careful and researchers need to be careful. Who's the actual person at the top of it? Is it David Rockefeller? Is it some member of the Rothschild family? Is it some member that we don't know about within the deep black budget community? Or is it the aliens themselves in one form or another? I guess we can ask ourselves what is the likelihood that the non-human intelligences that are behind the UFO phenomenon are managing the cover-up to some extent. I think we could say a few things. One, we can say they do not have an interest in being out there, in being publicly acknowledged. They do operate by stealth. I think they've always operated by stealth. So they have an interest in maintaining a cover of secrecy. Uh, toward that end, if I were tasked with doing counterintelligence on the cover-up, I would have to consider the likelihood that they themselves have some role to play in the, in the secrecy. There is a, a story about a famous murdered remote viewer by the name of Pat Price back in the 1970s. Pat Price was possibly the best remote viewer the United States ever had. He was an off-the-charts remote viewer. He was that good. He had one of the rare abilities to read alphanumeric information. That is, in other words, he could read documents and uh, file cabinets and things like this. He was extremely, extremely proficient. On one occasion, he did, on his own, he said, some remote viewing work on where alien bases were here on planet Earth. He strolled into the office in the mid-70s of Hal Puthoff, who was running the program, and said, oh yes, by the way, I thought I would just on my spare time look to see where the alien bases were. This is true, he said this, and he identified uh, several. They were all basically in mountain areas. So one was in the Pyrenees, one was in Mount Hayes, Alaska, and he said regarding that base, the Mount Hayes, Alaska base, he said that has political protection in the United States government. He said they have their people in the U.S. government who are making sure that no one pries in on that base. That particular base, uh, the way Pat Price described it, it was somewhat similar to how you might look at the base in the, in the Hollywood movie Men in Black, you know, the huge alien depot where all the different races go, and, and humans as well. Uh, not quite, he, I don't think he described it with quite the humor that you'd get in, in the movie, but in other words, a, a big transit point. And in fact, what Pat Price said to put off about that base is when he was remote viewing it, they began remote viewing him, and he pulled away out of fear. So if that's true, and that would seem to indicate to me that there is some level of collaboration and or control that is being exercised by them within our society. Pat Price, I think, was certainly murdered 
in the mid-1970s. I think there's no question about this. When people look into the circumstances of his death, it looked like he was poisoned with a cup of coffee in a, in a Las Vegas hotel. In the early years of his administration, Ronald Reagan received a letter from Dr. Edward Teller, the father of the H-bomb. Teller asked Reagan to consider implementing the Strategic Defense Initiative, also known as Star Wars. In this letter, Teller warns that a menace greater than the nuclear arms race exists. It does not originate here on Earth, but comes from space itself. Was the Star Wars program, later begun by President Reagan, created to stop hostile aliens? But what must be recognized is that our security is based on being prepared to meet all threats. There was a time when we depended on coastal forts and artillery batteries because with the weaponry of that day, any attack would have had to come by sea. Well, this is a different world, and our defenses must be based on recognition and awareness of the weaponry possessed by other nations in the nuclear age. We can't afford to believe that we will never be threatened. There have been two world wars in my lifetime. We didn't start them, and indeed did everything we could to avoid being drawn into them. But we were ill-prepared for both. Had we been better prepared, peace might have been preserved. Teller wrote a letter to President Reagan warning him about dangerous aliens, and he did it because he was probably blocked from having any direct communication with the president on the issue. Now, we know, according to the Serpo documents, that Reagan was probably briefed in 1981 on the aliens, but what they told him was kind of a nice story. I mean, he was told that four out of the five alien species we know about are friendly, and some of them might even help us if the bad ones went after us. And it may be that Teller knew more about how many hostile races were really out there, what their real objectives were, and he was trying to warn Reagan not to believe the guys that were telling him these airy-fairy, happy-go-lucky stories about the good aliens. Because I don't think anybody's gonna help us if things get bad with the aliens at all. We're on our own, so we gotta keep developing our own technology. These are stories that have come to us again and again and again. They've come to me, relating about uh, individuals who look just like you and me, but are not just like you and me. Individuals who are intensely telepathic, who are associated with um, often the UFO phenomenon. There are certainly stories, legitimate ones, I think, within the abduction research that indicate human and non-human collaboration. The Travis Walton abduction case comes to mind, in which Travis Walton in 1975 was aboard a craft, saw non-humans, and saw very human-looking people on this craft. Travis, get back here! Travis! <laughs> every indication that extraterrestrials have been involved with humanity's existence on Earth ever since the dawn of any type of hominid life whatsoever. Even if we're going back to the anthropological history of humankind, where we're dealing with primitive species like Homo habilis and Homo erectus, there appears to be direct extraterrestrial involvement because when we look at the work, for example, of Michael Cremo with Forbidden Archaeology, we're seeing records and actual physical artifacts being dug up all over the Earth, suggesting intelligent hominids have been visiting us for millions of years. Let's say we were an alien group and we were here on Earth. We don't look like the natives, but we have an interest in their civilization. We have an interest in monitoring. Maybe we even have an interest in managing them because we realize that they're shooting like this in terms of their technology and they're about to leap into our world whether we like it or not. So we might want to establish a presence and influence among them. We might want to have a base on their world for some reason. If we did, how would we do that? Well, we would have to have our own people who look just like them, our own fifth column. Is this really the case? I don't know that it's the case. I think you'd be foolish not to consider it as 
a reasonable thing. It actually works very well with the evidence that has come to me from a number of individuals who've had encounters with very highly strange individuals who just don't seem human like the rest of us. This suggests the possibility that we are a gardened race, that we are actually being very carefully monitored and watched, and that certain interventions take place at different times in order to steer our collective evolution along certain lines that were believed to be desirable. Furthermore, it does appear that there is a war taking place between negative and positive extraterrestrials in which either side is attempting to steer human evolution towards its own greater benefit. The negative side appears to be using the Earth as a fear farm. In other words, they procure the energy of our fear, our sadness, our materialism, our depression and anger as actually an energetic sustenance. Whereas the positive beings seem to be in alignment with the great teachings of the ancient mystery schools and religious texts in which their desire is for us to open our hearts, to become more loving, more forgiving and more compassionate, and in seeing that we are ultimately empty awareness, as the Tibetans would say, and when we harness that awareness, we actually return to this ascended state or the rainbow body, as it were. This is a war that is still ongoing at this time. The stakes are very high, and the outcome is ultimately of your personal choice. In the 1980s, documents surfaced that suggested that President Truman in the 1950s was so worried about the alien presence that he created a secret group of men to look into the subject. This group of military people, scientists, and politicians would meet in secret. Their name became known as Majestic 12, or MJ-12. In the early 90s, there was a fairly prominent UFO researcher by the name of Bob Exler, and he was involved in a lot of different uh, kind of investigative activities. One of the things that he did was he had a telephone conversation with former NSA director Bobby Ray Inman, who within the intelligence community is something of a legend. After Inman left the NSA and left U.S. formal government service, he became a leading executive of the SAIC, which is one of the major defense contractors, one of the top, most prestigious defense contractors in the nation. Bobby Ray Inman is among almost anyone you can think of, very plugged in to what is going on with all kinds of realities, including the UFO reality. Exo had a conversation with him on the phone and would not use the word extraterrestrial, would not use the word UFO explicitly, but in the context of his conversation with Inman, made it very clear that this is what he was talking about, uh, and asked Inman about the reality of this. Uh, this is shortly after things like the Majestic 12 documents became known after um, in the late 1980s. And it's very evident from the conversation, as reported by Exler, that Inman acknowledge the reality of a group like MJ-12, that is an oversight group managing the UFO reality. So I think that this actually happened. I would add that Exler's conversation with Inman is not the only type of conversation that confirmed the reality of MJ-12. I think equally important was a series of conversations held with a scientist named Eric Walker. Now, Eric Walker was a friend of Dwight Eisenhower. He was a former president of Penn State University. and most significantly was the head of an organization known as the Institute for Defense Studies. This is a powerful defense think tank. Researcher Grant Cameron, Scott Crane, and a few other people encountered Walker in the late 80s after MJ-12 became out there, and they found him. Their own research essentially led them to Walker, and Walker, in his first few conversations with them, absolutely admitted and acknowledged the reality of a group like MJ-12. Said almost exactly the same type of uh, things that Inman said, but even more explicit. The amount of secrecy involved in the UFO cover-up is truly astonishing. Once you start to assimilate the knowledge that we are sharing with you in this program, you can't look at the world the same way ever again. And that is what you would call the paradigm shift. But in this case, the paradigm shift is so large that Every fundamental assumption about life on Earth and about what the universe is and the nature of consciousness and the nature of biological life, we find out that we're not so special, we're not so unique and priceless. Humanity might be far more widespread than we believe, and I think that makes some people worry that we might be more expendable because we're not the only jewel of conscious life in the universe. 
However, we are told that we are in fact very precious and we are highly guarded. But why the secrecy? What is the objective here? The people who are in power in this planet profit off of ignorance. They don't want us to stop using a century old technology for our motor vehicle transportation. They don't want us to have free energy. They don't want anti-gravity. They don't want the ability for humans to heal because they believe that population is an enemy that is undesirable and they must reduce those numbers by any means they can, including weaponizing our food supply, creating what they call voluntary population control. The objective is to keep us dumb, to keep us easily controlled. Therefore, we work, we generate money, that money is taken from us, and it is aggregated into the secret space program. That money is all being invested off world or under the Earth's surface. We don't get to see any of it. And if we were told the truth, all of these crimes would have to be accounted for. Massive reparations would have to take place. And very likely, many of the people involved in doing this to us would be subject to trial and would be subject to judgment, which could very easily include the death penalty. When I started talking to people who uh, claimed to have had this abduction experience or, or, you know, being taken by aliens, for everyone I talked to who seemed to think it was a traumatic event, in fact, the very term abduction, you know, is negative, makes it sound like that's a really terrible thing. And I can understand where people are, you know, feel like they've been, uh, you know, taken against their will and, and uh, I can understand the negative uh, of that. But I talked to an equal number of people who said, well, I had the same experience. And I said, I thought it was a pleasant experience. In fact, I had one, one woman tell me, uh, I felt like I was an honored guest. So I think the phenomenon has probably not been presented in its entirety. I think that the people who feel like they've had a scary or traumatic uh, event, uh, you know, they tend to go seek help, professional help, or they join these support groups, and their, their story becomes public. And as a result, we have this whole popular negative connotation of abduction. But to the best of my ability, uh, everyone who says, I've been abducted, they, at some point they get brought back. Okay, and, uh, and then like I said, there's an equal number of people who say, well, I thought it was kind of cool. You know, they gave me a little tour, took me to another planet, showed me all this stuff, you know. So uh, I don't think that we yet have uh, actually engaged the true extent of the phenomena. The alien presence on Earth has been with us since the beginning. As difficult a subject as it is, the governments of Earth are not helping us understand the problem.